Good afternoon. Attorney Protective would like to welcome you to today's webinar, The High Cost of Poor Legal Writing. Well, we are thrilled to be able to present this webinar, which is co-sponsored by Scribes, the American Society of Legal Writers. As you can see from the materials, we have a powerhouse panel that will unpack the key ingredients of effective legal writing and offer perspectives on how practitioners can bring greater clarity and vigor to the written work. Let me quickly introduce our speakers. For their full bios, please reference your materials. Our moderator today is Darby Dickerson, President and Dean of Southwestern Law School. Our panelists are Erwin Chemerinsky, Dean and Jesse H. Chopper, Distinguished Professor of Law at University of California, Berkeley School of Law. Allison Ho, partner and co-chair of the Appellate and Constitutional Practice Group at Gibson, Dunn & Crutcher out of Dallas, Texas, and Wallace B. Jefferson, former Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Texas and partner at Alexander DeBose and Jefferson out of Austin, Texas. With that, I would like to hand it over to your moderator today, Dean Darby Dickerson. Thank you, Erin, and thank you everyone for joining us today. We look forward to sharing some insights and information with you. Let's get warmed up here. I'd like each panelist to think about exceptional legal writers and describe one or two qualities that make their written work so good. Allison, let's start with you. Thank you, Darby. And first of all, let me just say what, a, what an honor and a privilege it is um, to be on this panel with you and Erwin and Wallace. Um, you know, asking, asking me to sort of pick out a favorite um, writer is a little bit like asking a parent to pick a favorite child. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give a team award, and that is to the U.S. Solicitor General's Office. I think they really do live up to the motto of practice makes perfect. And I think they're brief, in brief after brief, they combine, you know, top flight advocacy um, being clear, being concise, um, yet also just being beyond reproach um, in terms of their uh, candor before the, the court. Thank you. That's a great team. Wallace, let's move to you. Um, I would go with Abraham Lincoln and the Gettysburg Address. It was 10 sentences, uh, 272 words, and yet it conveyed uh, to the nation and the world uh, just about everything you needed to know about a profound conflict in the United States. Um, efficient with words, uh, but powerful with concept. Uh, it is memorable and is effective, you know, these centuries later. Thank you, and Irwin, let's hear from you. I'll pick a couple of Supreme Court justices. I think the best writers in history were Louis Brandeis and Robert Jackson. Some of it was the clarity with which they wrote. Some of it was the power of their language. And I just want to express a slight dissent to the Solicitor General's office. I think their briefs are great with one exception. They don't put in headings. They just use Roman numerals and letters. And I wish they did headings, because I think headings make briefs much more readable. Erwin, can you say a little bit more about headings? I know we'll get to that later, but that's, I think, a, a great Point worth driving home. I really like when a brief has Roman number one and it tells us the main point. A, it tells us the main sub point, little one, and it tells us what that is. And solicitor general office briefs tend to just use A and one without giving the heading. And I think it really helps the reader, much like an abstract does in reading an article, to have a sense of what's about to follow. But again, I, I don't disagree with Allison. I think their briefs are clear and well written. I just wish they had headings. Thank you. Let's move on to a topic that ties to the title of our presentation. Can you each share a story or example of how poor legal writing can exact a high cost, either for clients or for attorneys or both? Erwin, let me start with you on this one. Thank you. I'll use an example of a brief that was very sarcastic and caustic and so angered the judge that I think it played a role in the decision. I know we're going to talk more about sarcasm later, but I fear that the use of sarcastic, caustic language, attacks on other lawyers in briefs, has gone up over the years. And I know of an instance 
And I was, thankfully, the opposing counsel, and it worked to my benefit, where the judge was so put off by the brief that I think it really influenced the decision. Thank you. Wallace, Ms. let's move to you. Well, we're also going to talk about knowing your audience uh, later, so we'll get into more detail on that. But I would give, as an example, a brief uh, that uh, is uh, targeted to a discretionary court like a uh, our court in the Supreme Court of Texas had discretionary review um, and is dense and full of facts and full of um, uh, arguments that really don't capture the need for the court to take up a case that's important to the jurisprudence of the state. And so um, a brief like that doesn't understand that the audience um, uh, for a discretionary court is one where the court picks and chooses the most important cases that are going to move forward and advance the jurisprudence of that state. Um, and I've seen it, I saw it time after time on my nearly 13 years on the court. And now that I'm back in practice, um, it's something that I have to talk to my co-counsel about. Uh, and, and that is to hone the argument to the audience um, and make it effective that way. Otherwise, uh, the court has um, plenty of discretion to turn it down. And if you're a court that has mandatory review, um, if your brief doesn't tell the story the way you want and that advances your client's interest, then the court is either going to look to your adversary or is going to write on its own. And neither neither of those uh, give, give you the ability to be an advocate for your client. And Allison. So one place that I uh, repeatedly see uh, poor legal writing exacting a cost is that oral argument. Um, and I know we're focusing on briefing today, but you know you're, you have so little time at oral argument, and you really want to be closing closing the deal and focusing on your most persuasive points. And if instead you're having to spend precious time um, responding to questions about uh, misleading case uh, citations or parentheticals or record citations that aren't uh, entirely accurate um, or as as we've been talking about um, kind of you know over overly sarcastic um, or disparaging remarks um, I think that is that is a, a sort of visible and transparent uh, place um, where I, I see time and again um, the, the, the cost of poor legal writing borne both by the advocate um, and ultimately by the client. Thanks, Allison. And I'll hop in here. When I was a brand new lawyer clerking in the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit, I was shocked at one oral argument where the judges just absolutely dressed down one of the attorneys and sanctioned the attorney because there were so many typographical errors in the brief. It was so distracting, those typographical errors, that the court had a really hard time focusing and finding the merits of the case. I also teach legal writing and legal drafting, and I see case after case after case where one party or another uh, added a zero, forgot a zero, put the comma in the wrong place, put the period in the wrong place, and it, it changed the meaning of the agreement and cost one side a lot of money or left one side not getting as much money as they thought they were going to. So there are a lot of ways that poor legal writing can cost both clients and attorneys. Let's now move to some specific topics. Wallace, I'm going to start with you on this one. Talk to us about why it is so important, and maybe the number one rule in writing, to know your audience. Uh, I do think it's the number one rule. So um, we're talking to lawyers here, and uh, the audience uh, for legal writing is usually a court. It can be others. It can be a client. It can be you know the opposing counsel in settlement negotiations. But let's talk about um, courts. Uh, you know, you have generally three levels: a trial court that has a huge volume of work and often doesn't have help, um, doesn't have uh, law clerks to assist in digesting uh, complex cases. And so for a court like that, uh, whose time is very limited, uh, you want to get to the point as quickly as you can and know the judge if you have the ability to know so. Some judges 
are renowned for reading every single word. Others uh, are known for just reading the first page or highlights of opinions. And so get to know who, the, who that audience is. Um, if it's a court of appeals, you know, who are the justices on the court of appeals? Uh, typically in Texas, it would be a three judge panel. You can do your research about those judges in advance and kind of know what they like and dislike. Um, are they the kind that will read the briefs themselves or will they have a law clerk or staff attorney uh, prepare a memo? Um, and if you can get that information, then you know whether you're writing to a first year law clerk, an experienced uh, staff attorney or a judge that you know has whatever uh, level of experience that judge has. And then, uh, as I've already mentioned, a discretionary court. So, uh, so many times, uh, back in pra now that I'm back in practice, a lawyer will say, well, let's just file the brief we filed in the Court of Appeals, you know, put a new title on it and file it in the Supreme Court. Well, that disregards what the Supreme Court's task is. It is not an error correction court. It is a court that will pluck a case out of the thousands that are presented uh, because it wants to advance the law in a certain respect. And so uh, if you're writing to that court initially, you know, you're not writing so much to say we should win and the other side should lose because the, the court's not so concerned about the individual parties. You should say this case is important, whichever way uh, it comes out, because it will um, make uh, the law on a, a recurring and important uh, issue. And so know your audience is, I guess, the first rule. Thank you, Wallace. Erwin, let me bring you into this conversation. I just want to say yes, emphatically, to everything that Wallace just said. All communication is to an audience. That's true if we're speaking. It's true if we're writing. And so I think Wallace's example of a petition for review to a highest court is such a good one. When I write a cert petition to the United States Supreme Court, I know I'm writing to a few law clerks. And I know that I need to engage them. And I know what my brief needs to be is to explain to them why this case should be taken. It's not about why I should win. If they take the case, I'll get the chance for that brief. For all writing that I do, I'm very conscious of who's the audience. A law review article has a different audience than, say, a popular press book, which would have a different audience than, say, a book that's written for law students. Op-eds have a different audience than, say, scholarly writing. And there's many different kinds of writing. Some writing is just to inform. It might be an associate writing to inform a partner about the law. Some is to persuade. But whatever it is, it's so important to keep in mind who's the audience and what are you trying to achieve with that writing. Thank you, Erwin. Allison, um, I'd like to move over to you and start thinking about some secondary audiences for our work that maybe we're not thinking about. So if you could talk about law clerks and externs and just how much we can assume familiarity with the concepts that we're writing about. Certainly, and I think one thing to begin by underscoring is, is a point in the slide, which is that while we, we speak about knowing your audience as a shorthand, um, for most briefs, the audience is not monolithic. Um, a, a, judges uh, are, are part of the audience. The client is part of the audience. The other side is part of the audience. The press may be part of the audience. Um, and law clerks and externs are definitely part of, of that audience. And I think it's, it's just so, so crucial to realize that, you know, by the time that you sit down to write your brief, you're, you're kind of the expert um, on whatever it is you're writing about. And it can be very easy to assume familiarity um, with concepts that to a busy reader who is sitting down with, you know, a stack of a dozen briefs um, that cover the gamut from you know, criminal law to ERISA to constitutional law um, to make it as easy as possible for your reader to grasp quickly um, what it is you're talking about and, and the concepts uh, that are important to, to explain. I think that's, that's one reason why I've often found that having um, a non-lawyer, and I hate that 
term um, <laughs> that we lawyers use. Uh, but to have someone who's not a lawyer read a draft and see if it's clear. Because in, in my experience, that perspective is really closer to a, 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 a first-year uh, law clerk uh, right out of law school or, or even a general judge who's been on the benches um, for decades um, but is moving through briefs, covering many different subjects, many different topics um, in short order. Allison, let me stay with you. Some clients want their attorneys to be aggressive and attack the other side. Can you talk to us about why it's important to avoid personal attacks and sarc sarcasm? We also got a question from the audience that if you want to address or maybe one of the other panelists wants to hop in um, after you answer the question I just posed and address, and that's when and how is the line crossed from attacking an argument to attacking the lawyer asserting hmm. the argument? Uh, that's, that, that's a great question. Um, and I'll, I'll, start, I'll start with the question you posed, Darby. And I, I think, you know, like, like most things in life, sort of the answer is really because, <laughs> you know, the right thing to do is not to show disrespect or disparagement um, to others. I think even if even if you weren't naturally inclined or your client wasn't naturally inclined to take the high road, um, your self-interest should lead you in the same direction. I think the simplest reason why you shouldn't do it is because it's not only ineffective, but it can actually be counterproductive. And I think that is that is particularly true um, when you are talking about the court below, the judge below, um, the decision below. Um, I think that's where I sort of see things bleed over. And, you know, I think it's just it's human nature sometimes, and especially we lawyers, um, to sort of want to take the other side of something. And I think when you have an advocate before you who is just really making a person making a, a, an argument that feels very much like a personal attack um, is just it's ineffective and it's and it's counter counterproductive. Um, I would say in terms of you know what what crosses crosses the line. I mean I think there are just some basic basic sort of things that I think aren't aren't just semantics. Um, like, you know, referring to, you know, the decision below um, in, instead of, you know, the, the trial judge or, or calling out um, opposing counsel when there's no need to do so. And I think it's hard to sort of articulate hard and fast rules in this area. I think it's just, you know, when, you're, when, you're, when your instinct tells you, hmm, I wonder if this is close uh, to the line or I wonder if it's too much, um, then I would sort of remove any appearance of, of that and not, not go in, in that direction. You know what, this reminds me of what you were saying at the end, reminds me of uh, a phrase in getting to yes, be hard on the issues, uh, but not on the people. So don't make it personal, mm -hmm. talk about the merits of the issues and focus on that. Wallace, I'm going to bring you into this discussion about ad hominem attacks and sarcasm for a judicial view of those matters. In addition, this topic starts drawing us into the topic of your client as an audience of your work. How do you calibrate client expectations when you know your primary audience might be a judge and the judge is likely to have different expectations from those of your client? Uh, so that's an excellent uh, question, um, and it, uh, it it arises very often um, where the client may want uh, you to attack uh, the other side, um, or the client may want you to emphasize a legal point that you don't think is going to uh, gain much attention in in the court that you're uh, writing to, and so it is. Uh, it's got to be a very frank and honest. Uh, dialogue with the client, um, and what I tell them is, look, you, you've you, you've retained me for a reason, and that is my experience and 
uh, my knowledge of the court, um, my effectiveness, you know, there. And so you're going to have to let me be your counselor. And um, this is an area that uh, that you're asking me to to present that is really going to be either counterproductive or uh, at most neutral and, and waste time that we could, you know, reserve for the stronger arguments. And so that dialogue has to happen all the time. And, and uh, and it's the same kind of di dialogue that Allison is talking about um, in, in terms of, you know, what is your mission? What is your goal? What is what is the outcome that you're trying to achieve? Um, and if you have that conversation with your client or with your co-counsel, um, then you're going to be getting a brief that's, that, that is um, more able to achieve that, that result. Um, and it is it's it's surprising me it surprised me how often uh it is necessary to engage in that but uh but but it's essential and so i do it uh, just about every time now there are some clients that i have that you know they they just let you run with it um uh so that's one thing but but very often you have to have that debate and i just wanted to say one thing about uh what allison said i think it's absolutely correct to say you know if you have time Share the draft with somebody who is not familiar with the case at all, um, that is not a lawyer, would be helpful to see if they can grasp what you're saying. Uh, and and if you can do that, you know, then you're more likely to be able to reach the reach your audience in, in any case. Thank you. One of our audience members asked, how do you find out who your audience is? I think that's a great question. And it has layers, right? So this, this slide that we just put up talks about the primary reader. Often you know who that's going to be. It's a judge. It's the opposing counsel. But you do have to think about the different layers of audiences like we've discussed. Your client is always going to be an audience of your work. And then you've got to think who else is working with the primary reader. Law clerks, maybe first-year externs who are going to be given this matter to to um, triage before it moves its way up to the judge. So you don't always know who your complete audience will be, but often you're focusing most on your primary audience. And you do need to know who they are, know who's on the court that you're submitting something to. You may or may not know who the panel members are going to be, if it's a, a one or three person panel. But you can gain information about possibilities and figure out their preferences um, by seeing where they've spoken, seeing if they've actually articulated their preferences in any materials. One topic that the group talked about in advance, and we thought it fit under this concept of audience, is in the past few, past couple of years, it's becoming more common in some realms to use their, T-H-E-I-R, as a pronoun for an individual. So in my world, I'm in a law school, it's almost second nature to use their as the individual pronoun instead of his or her these days. Wallace, let me start with you. Do you have some thoughts on their as a pronoun for an individual? You know, so the, the I would I would start to uh, by looking at what the the court's preferences are if you can determine them um in the fifth circuit uh the U U u.s court of appeals for the fifth circuit there are some judges that are um, completely opposed uh to any um, evolution of pronouns and uh so if you can avoid using t-h-e-i-r the way you just um, described then i think it's uh better to do so it, it may not feel like it is consistent with how you approach, you know, the world these days. But again, it's your audience that matters uh, more than uh, than your than personal um, affections uh, or affectations. Um, and so I think that's the that's the key. And the other key is to the extent you can avoid controversy that is that will not advance your case. And this goes beyond uh, pronouns to other areas of culture or life, then uh, if you don't need to use them to uh, make your argument, then you avoid them. Uh, at least that's what I would do. Uh, so I would be um, 
uh, I, I would work hard to focus on the end result that you're trying to achieve and uh, and get rid of any uh, distractions from it. Thank you. Um, there's a question in the audience that the audience posed I want to bring in. And Erwin, I'm going to start with you to see if you have some advice. How do you respond to an ad hominem attack against you or your client in a brief? Often the answer is you don't. Now, if it is relevant to the case, then if you have to defend the integrity of your client or your integrity to do so, but I often find that ad hominem attacks make the person who's looking at them seem who's making them seem worse, and they don't need or should have a response. And I also should say, this isn't just about ad hominem attacks. I also think it's about not ridiculing the other side's arguments. I've seen so many briefs that use sarcasm and dismissive language that doesn't advance the content. So, Darby, I think the answer to the specific question is it really depends on the attack and whether or not the credibility of the client or the lawyer needs to have a response made. Great. Thank you. And Wallace, I'm going to come back to you for a moment to talk about the client issue because someone has asked about this. Like, when do you defer to the client's wishes if you believe that what the client wants to do is going to upset the primary reader, often a judge? Uh, I would approach it the way I did on a on a collegial court. Um, so at, at the Supreme Court, uh, I would draft an opinion and circulate it to my eight colleagues. And then there would be, um, you know, all kinds of um, comments on the draft. And uh, a justice would say, can you change, you know, this uh, portion of the opinion uh, would you restructure it this way or that way? Um, and what I would do is try to accommodate them as much as I could to bring them on board. Um, and often, what they wanted was to be heard, um, and for for you know for me to listen and to incorporate to the extent I could uh, the uh, the point that they wanted uh, the opinion to make. Um, and so I I would do the same thing with the client. Uh, they have a, a very direct interest, and, and sometimes you have to defer to them because that is the, that's the reason they hired you is, is to get to a certain result. Um, but the way you approach it uh, can be a subject of conversation. And so uh, the client says, uh, "Thank you for this draft of the brief. Would you can you change all of this?" And I think I would consider it and do a new draft and then explain why I uh, adopted some of the some of the points that they wanted to make and why didn't others, and, and how uh, if we had adopted the positions that didn't make it into the draft, it might defeat uh, the old overall goal in, in, in the case. And so um, a, a continued conversation where you're listening and responding and the, the brief evolves as a result. Now, there have been times when I've said, I, I think, you know, I can get you to a certain point. Uh, if you want to, you know, continue to ins uh, insist on making some point that would be um, contrary to the law or to precedent or uh, to the facts, uh, then then I would offer that they should, you know, consider retaining other counsel for that proposition. Thank you. I'm going to take one more audience question that ties to a point that Allison was talking about before we move on to presenting the facts. Allison, you talked about sharing your work with someone who's not a lawyer. And what do the audience members ask? Are there confidentiality rules when asking someone outside of the office to read your work? Or should you find non-lawyers within the law firm, you know, the support staff, to be your reader? That's a great, that's a great point for clarification. Yes, confidentiality concerns um, do uh, do mean that you know you're primarily sharing uh, sharing work uh, with non lawyers in your in your in your own office. Thank you. Let's do move on to presenting the the facts. Uh, Allison, I'm going to stick with you. Can you give us some tips about the best way to organize facts to help the reader follow along? Sure. And let me just start by just some sort of general comments about fact sections. I, I'm really passionate about um, 
the facts section of briefs. I, I, I really believe that by the time you've finished reading the facts section in a brief, you should be convinced um, of the rightness of my client's cause, and the argument section just sort of lays out, all right, here, here are the legal reasons, here, here's the opinion that flows flows from that from that instinct. So I think sort of one thing, even as you just want to be absolutely scrupulous in terms of being um, honest and not, the, not argumentative, I think not being argumentative in the facts does not mean not using the facts to tell your story, um, which I think is just really, really important um, to facts. So in terms of organizing um, the facts, for me, there's really not a one-size-fits-all approach. I usually spend some time thinking about the nature of the case and how it would make sense to organize. I'll just give an example. You know, if it's an administrative law case um, where there's maybe like a, a regulatory background or, or context that's important to understanding the story or the narrative, um, I might decide to begin with that um, just so the reader will have an understanding, a better understanding of the story that the brief is going to tell um, in, in the facts. Um, and I do, I do agree um, very much, uh, Erwin, with your point about headers being important. I sometimes feel like a lot of attention is paid to headers in argument sections and not as much in fact sections um, in terms of you might just get the one word, you know, background or, you know, proceedings. And I always like to check when I get through with the fact section just to sort of view the table of content, contents. And I think to the extent that a lot of readers now may start with the table of contents as sort of a preview of your argument, um, I think it can be important to make sure that the headers in your facts section help orient the reader and sort of stand alone. Um, so that's sort of my gut check in terms of organizing um, the facts. Um, I think, just to sum up, kind of recognizing that there isn't a one-size-fits-all um, to organizing, I think headers are, are important, um, short paragraphs, uh, especially in fact sections for easy um, readability um, and, and, and readable, comprehensible um, headlines that, and headers that tell your story um, and also provide uh, an organization and a roadmap for your reader. Thank you, Allison. Wallace, can you talk to us about why, especially from a judicial perspective, being honest about the facts is so important? Well, it's it's as simple as um, if you are dishonest about the facts, then your credibility uh, for the remainder of your arguments is put to the test, um, and it is um, and it is just and it's disappointing. Um, a judge thinks that a member of the bar, who is an officer of the court, um, is going to present honestly what the record shows, and if that lawyer doesn't do that, uh, then it's going to impact the judge's view of the client and the overall case. And so, you know, one of the first things I had, uh, one of my professors was Charles Allen Wright uh, when I was at University of Texas. And he always advised in, you know, writing uh, briefs or, or anything to the court is, you know, understand what your weakest point is. Be um, honest and, and forthcoming about that and then deal with it. And the judges will appreciate it. You don't have to hide it. You don't have to, um, to misrepresent it. Um, put it out there. And then the lawyer's job is to make the strongest case, even uh, with um, uh, facts that are, that are not as good as you would want them to be. And I will say this, that most judges um, that have any kind of experience understand that we're talking about human beings and that nothing, very, very little in litigation, especially when it reaches the highest court, is plain and simple and easy and, you know, without, um, you know, fault on, on both parties or all parties' sides. You know, the judges are sophisticated enough to understand that. 
and still know that they, their job is to announce the rule of law given an honest recitation of the facts. Thank you. Erwin, um, yes. Can you give us some effective strategies for building context within the facts? Yes, and if I can go back to what we've just been talking about, I once heard a speech by the then Chief Judge of the Tenth Circuit, Robert Henry, where he asked his audience, what's the most important part of a brief? And the lawyers guessed various things. And ultimately, Judge Henry answered his own question and said, for me as a judge, the most important part of the brief is the lawyer's name on the front cover. And I think this goes to what we talked about earlier. Obviously, we want to please our clients, but it's still my name as a lawyer that's on the cover. And if I'm distorting the facts in some way, I will lose the confidence of that judge, not just in that case, but all the times I appear in front of the judge in the future. I think setting the context is very important with regard to the facts. I'm always trying to tell a story. For any brief I write or anything I write, there's going to be a narrative. I have a presumption that if I'm telling a story, I'm going to do so chronologically because that's how people think, but it doesn't have to be that way. Let me give an example that's concrete. It's one that Wallace would relate to. I argued a case in the Supreme Court about 15 years ago that involves a Ten Commandments monument that sits right between the Texas Supreme Court and the Texas State Capitol. Six foot high, three foot wide, beginning with the letters, I am the Lord thy God. And I wanted to tell a certain story about this. In fact, I put a picture of the monument in my cert petition as well as my brief because it got across the central narrative this is a religious monument sitting at the seat of Texas state government. I still lost 5-4 in the Supreme Court, but ultimately what I was trying to do was set a context. The context is going to depend on the case. It's hard to generalize, but you're always trying to tell a story, a story that will engage and a story that will persuade. And Zarbi, I'll, I'll say, um, I've read the briefs in that case a long time ago um, and, and was very impressed with Ern's. Uh, um, uh, brief writing in that case. And uh, if I can make just one point, since he brought it up, he, that he put a picture of that monument in the brief. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is these days, uh, a lot of judges are reading briefs online now. Uh, it used to be when I first started at the court in 2001, I would bring bankers boxes home full of briefs and I would read them, you know, highlight and, and all of that. But very quickly, we transitioned into electronic briefs. And now it is relatively easy uh, to insert images into a brief or relevant diagrams or even photos in the text of a legal document. Um, and that can be uh, very powerful as a persuasive tool in writing. Thank you, Wallace. Erwin, there's an audience question I'd like to toss your way. And it says, how about settings where you believe opposing counsel has affirmatively misrepresented something in the facts, and it appears that the trial court has accepted the false statement as true. You're now before an appellate panel. Um, how do you present that issue to rebut it without seeming too harsh or, or snarky or unprofessional? I just had exactly this experience in a case that I handled in the Ninth Circuit where the opposing side, in this instance it was the United States Attorney's Office, simply misrepresented what occurred at the trial court. All you can do in that circumstance is lay out the facts and provide all of the support you can for your version of the facts, explaining as clearly as you can what's wrong with their version. There's no need to engage in name-calling. Hopefully the facts will speak for themselves. But I think the key is support what you say the facts are as best you can possibly do. Thank you. Allison, let's switch topics now and talk about preparing strong introductions. Can you talk to us about the questions included on this slide? What should the writer include? How can the writer keep the introduction concise? And when do you draft the introduction? And I, I would love to talk about this. If there's something I'm more passionate about than fact sections, um, it's introductions, which I think are just critically important. And I, I'll begin by acknowledging I think there are 
you know, different, uh, different advocates have different approaches to introductions. Um, my own approach is I see an introduction um, as very different from the summary of argument. I see the introduction as a time to very concisely set forward, you know, your, your themes, to begin your narrative, um, and not get bogged down with a lot of supporting detail. And one of the questions in terms of practical tips for keeping the introduction concise, um, just a very practical tip is, uh, is imposing a pretty strict page limit on yourself. Um, obviously recognizing that you know, the, the precise number may change depending on the length of your brief. Um, I, I really like a one or a two page introduction, no more than three. I, th I think beyond, beyond that, um, you, you run the risk that your reader is just going to turn the page uh, over um, and not, not really get the, the full benefit of, of, your, of your introduction. Um, so I think context uh, in the introduction is key, um, garnering your, your reader's interest. You know, that's where you're, we've been talking about brief writing is really about telling a story. Um, and sort of the introduction is, is where, where the story begins. Um, I typically, in terms of when, when you would write it, um, again, I think different advocates have different approaches. Um, because for me, the introduction is sort of the framework and the vessel in which kind of everything, like you, you fit everything else that follows. I like to really, I like to get it pretty set before um, the rest of the brief gets written, bearing in mind that, you know, I may well need to, to make adjustments or tweaks to, to the introduction um, as, as the brief unfolds, if I end up making a different call about, you know, including an argument or not including it or something as, as the brief writing process goes on. But I, I absolutely spend more time um, on, on the introduction than, than any other uh, part, part of the brief, just because I think you, it's, it's scarce real estate. You want to make sure that every word in it um, is, is doing a job and is, is advancing your client's case. Thank you, Allison. Let's go ahead and move to the next point, which is directed at Irwin. How many points should you raise in your brief? There's no arbitrary right number of points. I can't tell you it's two or three or four. It obviously depends on the case, but more is not better. You need to make the arguments that are strongest on your side. There was a Supreme Court case many years ago, Jones versus Barnes, where the lawyer didn't make all of the arguments the client wanted. And the client argued ineffective assistance of counsel. And the Supreme Court said the lawyer has to choose, and good advocacy is choosing the stronger arguments and not weakening the brief by presenting the lesser arguments. I had an instance a number of years ago where I was representing somebody who had been convicted, and I was arguing the case in the Ninth Circuit. And I chose what I thought were the three strongest arguments. Alas, I lost. The client then filed a petition for habeas corpus claiming ineffective assistance of counsel because he said he had ten arguments that he wanted me to make. Not surprisingly, the district court found that that wasn't ineffective assistance of counsel. It's the role of the lawyer to choose the strongest arguments. Now, I agree with what Wallace said. Sometimes it requires conferring with the client and explaining why you're making some arguments and not others. But filling the brief with every possible argument really does undercut the strength of the arguments you want to win on. Thank you, Irwin. Let's now move to the topics of organization and structure. Wallace, can you kick us off on this topic? Why is a strong overall organization so important for a brief or any other document for that matter? Well, I, I think it's vital because um, a lot of our cases are, you know, they're complex. They're they're hard to understand um, for lawyers, even experienced lawyers. And so what you're trying to convey is um, there is a rationale uh, to uh, achieving the result that you want. And it, and it goes from 
you know, A to B um, and B to C, and the court can follow along and it makes sense. One of the, the worst things that I think um, a lawyer can do is, is be confusing, where, where a judge doesn't understand the roadmap, doesn't understand how to get uh, to the resolution that you're advancing, and, and, and then is, it becomes less your advocate and more your critic. Um, and so if you've got a tightly wound structure, uh, the story that you tell uh, makes sense. The court ultimately may not believe it or may not agree with the end result, but at least they can understand the argument. And if you have a judge or a court that understands the argument, you're more than halfway there. And the, the way I, the, I personally try to do it is, you know, outline the argument first and see if it uh, is uh, it makes sense and and its integrity is evident uh, in the outline and then move through the document uh, based on that structure and be willing to uh, alter the structure if ultimately it breaks down somewhere as you're as you're writing the brief. Um, I think that gives you the best shot of uh, presenting a brief that the court not only can understand but uh, can uh, agree with. Thanks, Wallace. Allison, moving to you, what advice can you share about how writers can help readers along? And we've had a specific audience member question about what's a roadmap? Great question. Um, and in thinking about um, sort of headings and roadmaps, um, let me start with headings first. We've, we've talked about how important um, headings are in orienting your reader. I think that the number one, um, uh, one of my pet peeves um, about headers is they can be simply too long um, to really serve their function. If, if your reader is having to puzzling, puzzle over a four or five line header, um, that really defeats the purpose of the header um, as, 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 a, as, a, as road mapping. Um, so that's one thing I, I try to be pretty ruthless, um, is, ma is making sure that my headers are concise enough um, to really serve their purpose. In terms of roadmaps, um, the way I think of roadmaps are things like, um, you know, when you, let's say you are, are, are addressing um, your friend on the other side's argument. Things like saying um, that argument uh, that argument is incorrect for at least three reasons, you know, first, second, third. Um, that case is distinguishable um, for two primary reasons, first and second. Um, so just that I think any time you're able to sort of give your reader a sense of what to expect, okay, I'm going to explain to you this and there are going to be three reasons one, two, three, and now I know I'm on to, to something else. I'm also a big believer in uh, short, the use of bullet points um, and lists, um, even using like one, two, three, uh, within, within briefs, um, again, as a way to roadmap and provide clarity uh, to, to, to your reader um, in, in a way that, again, I think the, the, the object of all of this is just to make it as easy as possible for your reader to quickly grasp your argument and, and the points that, that you're making. So I think that, that's sort of the ultimate goal with road mapping and headers, and you sort of need to evaluate uh, the strength and effectiveness of what you're doing through that lens. Great. I'll throw in two other tips, for, uh, and I'll attribute these to Brian Garner. You know, don't lose an opportunity to be persuasive in the heading. Some people just put a word, uh, like a topic for a heading, instead of writing a proposition. I agree with Allison, it's got to be concise. The other thing is, I cannot stand it when people write headings in all capital letter letters. I just, my eyes, my brain <laughs> freeze up. So um, do not put headings in capital letters. It will turn off your readers. Darby, I... Talking about, I, I, yes, Wallace. Oh, I was just going to say I agree with uh, both those points um, very much um, because, you know, you're trying to make it easy on the reader. And the other thing to remember is if you're reading 
a, a brief electronically these days, you can uh, often, and I use, I, I do, open the pane on the left side that has the bookmark. And so as you're reading, you can actually see what the next argument is going to be if the heading is descriptive enough and not overbearing, Allison, as, as you said, mm. but, uh, but just kind of simply states where the next argument is going. And I think that's very helpful to a reader. Well, and that's a nice transition to holding the reader's attention. Um, Erwin, can I impose on you to talk to us about the issue of trying to sound like a lawyer? Of course. I highly value clarity. It fits with everything else that we've talked about this morning. Often I find when people want to sound like a lawyer, they use jargon or Latin phrases or unduly complex sentences that undermine clarity. I think it all goes back to what we said earlier. The brief, the memo exists to communicate, and anything that gets away with effective communication shouldn't be part of whatever you're writing. Allison, talk to us about whether it's a good idea to use humor, metaphors, and creative examples, maybe literary references. So um, th this may may seem uh, contrary to type um, as a as a former English um, professor. Um, I generally tend to um, avoid unless sort of flows naturally, things like humor or literary uh, references. Um, I do really work hard to try to figure out sort of, and I, and I actually think of, I saw a question on this, on this front. I really do think it's worth um, spending some time putting together like common sense analogies. Um, I think one issue with humor or literary references is um, again, it gets back to what we talked about in terms of assuming um, what your what your audience knows and is aware of. So rather than sort of looking at a literary illusion um, or uh, something along those lines, I think it's more effective to to try to kind of take if you're especially if it's a rather complicated concept or argument that you're making to look for really common sense ways and examples um, to to explain it. Um, I, I Following up on something Erwin said, you know, sort of not, people feel like they need to, to write a certain way to sound like a lawyer. Um, I also think you see that sometimes in terms of the use of, you know, literary illusions or, um, or metaphors. And I think it's, it's, it's very possible to, be, to have a, an energy about your writing, a persuasiveness, to be engaging with your writing um, w without sort of rather self-consciously inserting um, humor, um, which as we all know can, can backfire, uh, or literary illusions or, or other metaphors. Thanks, Allison. Wallace, I think you want to make a comment on the, the humor and literary references point, but I'd also like to ask you as a former judge, to provide thoughts about repetition. We have a question from the audience, or maybe it's a point from the audience, who said that he, has a, he or she has a client who is convinced that um, as sort of a rule of science that people don't pay attention to a point unless you state it seven times, or you, the reader won't accept it until you state it seven times. So if you could talk to us about repetition. Sure, and um, on the literary and, and metaphors, I would say uh, they can be used sparingly and, and can be good. It can make it a, 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 a brief memorable. I mean, think of all the uh, Scalia phrases that we, you know, courts uh, or uh, lawyers now repeat often and courts do uh, because they just capture the moment. You don't hide an elephant in a mouse hole, you know, that sort of thing. Um, you just you get it, you know, from that. But I but I agree, you've got to be very careful about it, and you don't want to be too cute. On r repetitiveness, um, I you know I I haven't seen the science uh, that uh, supports the idea that you have to repeat something seven times before you get it. But one thing that it, that was frustrating to me was a lawyer that would uh, repeat you know what they considered to be you know the 
the winning argument or the winning fact um, 20 times, uh, you know, beginning at the, uh, on the first page and then throughout. And it started, uh, that started to look to me more like a crutch uh, that was intended to disregard all else that was vital to the case. Uh, so it made me suspicious. It also made me think, you know, does does the lawyer think I didn't read and didn't understand, you know, that this, this pivotal uh, point, I get it, uh, you know, so why am I having to read it again and again and again, uh, you know, throughout the brief? And so it, it, it may just be a pet peeve of mine, but I, I would avoid repetitiveness, um, you know, uh, for similar reasons of having somebody else read, uh, a brief and not you, so you can step away from it. You know, you might have somebody read the brief and see if the seven repeated phrases uh, uh, does does that distract, or can you write a brief where it, it becomes um, uh, important and uh, and known early on, so that you don't have to engage in uh, all of that repetition. Thank you. You know, it's hard to believe we're almost out of time, but Erwin, I'm going to ask you to address some distractors that writers want to avoid. I'm going to then hit a few key points, and we'll take a few questions after that before we conclude, and I kick it back to, to um, Aaron. So, Erwin, distractors sure. to avoid. Remember, you're trying to engage the reader, and anything that gets in the way of that has to be avoided. I find that block quotes often aren't read. There are times when the rules require that it be a block quote because it's so important that you use the language and present it in that way. But I try to avoid block quotes as much as possible, often breaking them into smaller quotes so it doesn't have to be as a block quote. Um, footnotes. There are certainly times when footnotes are appropriate, but a brief shouldn't read like a law review article, and often the footnotes don't get read the footnotes are just a distractor. Um, dates. Sometimes dates are really crucial. Sometimes they just get in the way and they're not necessary. Um, and Darby, I apologize. I'm going to have to leave right around 11 because I'm chairing a large meeting at exactly that time. Understood, Erwin. We, we appreciate you being with us. So hop off when you, you need to. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to take us all the way and, and let the audience know that in the slide deck, we have given you some recommended resources, a lot of books by Brian Garner. A lot of people have asked questions about transactional drafting, legal writing in plain English, and Garner's drafting and editing contracts are wonderful sources. The Red Book gives you a lot of just really practical advice, regardless of your, your type of writing. Um, there's also the, the Harvest Business Review Guide to Better Business Writing. Uh, two other books that I'll, or sources I'll point out. Um, you know, how your document looks matters. So I really suggest Typography for Lawyers by Matthew Butterick. You actually don't have to buy this book. He has a free website that you can use. We've had a lot of uh, back and forth in the, in the Q&A about inclusive language, and I found that this particular inclusive language guide that we've included the link to is one of the best I've seen. And then, of course, I can't um, help but to recommend the Scribes website with all of the tips that we have posted there. Um, so I'm sorry we didn't get to a lot of the, the topics, but I'm going to um, pose one question and then give it to Aaron. And if some of the, the um, panel can stay, maybe we can take a couple other questions. But um, does style really factor into the quality of writing? Does it matter? Do one of you want to tackle that in a minute or less? Is Erwin still on? I think he might have dropped off. Um, okay, well, I, I, I mean, I think I think style does matter. Everything matters um, in in your writing to a court, um, and the style to me should not be distracting. The focus should always be on the client and on what you're trying to uh, how you're trying to win. And when I say how you're trying to win. Uh, very often, a lawyer will just say, please reverse the judgment. Um, okay, well, what do we do next? Is it reverse and remand? And if you want, if, if the case is going to be remanded, um, uh, how? I mean, what is left to be tried? What is going to, 
occur in the Court of Appeals or the trial court. Um, so be very specific uh, about what you want the court to do. And um, it was true in the when when I was on the court, and it's still true in practice that often lawyers do not give that roadmap. You know, the 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 very reason that the brief is filed. <laughs> Uh, to the court to say what judgment they want, specific judgment do they want the court to um, render. So I'll stop there. Thanks, Wallace. Erin, I'm going to toss it back to you. Great. Thank you so much, Darby. Um, well, that concludes today's event. And again, certificates of attendance will be emailed to participants within one week. On behalf of Attorney Protective and Scribes, I would like to thank all of you for joining us for today's webinar. And I would also like to thank our moderator and panelists for today's discussion and for taking the time to share their advice and their great expertise with us today. So thank you all and have a great rest of the day.